Good evening. Thank you for joining us again with another awesome adventure in the Word of God. We just ask that you would be prayerful of this ministry, that we would continue to share with you the truth of God's Word as the Holy Spirit guides us and leads us. Let us always be faithful to God's will and to His way so that we might be able to share with you his revelation knowledge and you might be blessed in your walk with Christ. We come to you from New Life Ministries Church in Plato, Missouri on behalf of the pastor and the membership. We also come to you in the name of the Lord and by his guidance and his direction we share with you the truth of his word. Let us go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we just thank you for who you are. You're the true and the living God. There is none like you. There's no other but you. You're our creator. You're the source of all things. You are the cause of all things. There is no beginning and no end with you. For as you said in Deuteronomy, you stretch your hand toward heaven and live forever. We thank you, Lord for what you have done in our lives and what you're going to do that you have saved us and you have made us a peculiar treasure unto yourself we bless your name we glorify your name and we honor you but father i pray for these that are watching and are listening that your revelation knowledge will be revealed to them and the eyes of their understanding will be open to your truth and your truth alone Shut down every spirit of deception, bind it and cast it away, and let your, the truth of your word be manifested to us, and let us walk therein, to your glory, to your honor, and to your praise. We pray in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Amen and amen. Tonight, we want to talk to you about a word that is thrown around uh, so casually and so easily but I don't think uh, many of us really stop long enough to examine what that word really means from the scriptural standpoint when God speaks of his glory when the Lord Jesus speaks of the glory when the apostles write about the glory of God and the glory of the church we uh, we kind of uh, just nonchalantly take it and just like we do a lot of other things without any true uh, contemplation uh, without any kind of uh, uh, labor to really understand what they're talking about and uh, if you don't really understand something you really can't appreciate what it really is worth and sometimes because of the, the our misunderstanding of what glory is and what the, the glory of God is, we really don't appreciate it as we should. But hopefully tonight we'll be able to at least explore uh, some of what the Lord wants us to know about His glory. And that's why we titled this message tonight, See His Glory. If you would go with me first of all to the book of Isaiah the sixth chapter and we're going to begin reading in the first verse in the year that King Uzziah died I saw also the Lord sitting high I'm sorry let me try that again I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and his train filled the temple Isaiah uh, it is believed that uh, he started uh, his ministry of prophecy before this. However, this year that King Isaiah died was such a had such a uh, and an effect upon his ministry in the in that before he was ministering as a prophet and all, but he had not had a vision of who he was ministering for and sometimes we find ourselves in the same situation we'll start off in ministry 
because we feel led to do that and all but we haven't really got a revelation of the one that we're supposed to be ministering for and as a result of that we fail to understand what he wants uh, the, the people that he wants us to minister to and how he wanted us to minister to them so when we look at this um, this particular uh, incident in Isaiah's life it was such an incident that he remembered when it happened he remembered that it was the year that King Isaiah died uh, some have said that some historians have said that Isaiah was Isaiah's uncle so that would put Isaiah in a, uh, a royal family a part of royalty even as a prophet but he said, in that year that King Isaiah died, I saw also the law. Now this implies that he saw a lot of other things in that year. But the, the thing that stood out for him in that year, besides the fact of King Uzziah passing on, is that he saw the Lord. And sometimes we find ourselves in situations where there is sorrow, in situations where there is trauma, in situations where there is a loss, it is in those situations that we get a more clear vision of who God is in our lives. It's not that we didn't know about God before, it's not that we didn't try to serve God before, but it's in those traumatic times and those traumatic experiences that uh, our understanding of God is broadened. Our uh, experience of his, his presence, of his uh, providence, of his help, of his strength, we find those things more clearly defined and more clearly expressed in those times of trial and tribulation. But he looked, he, saw, he says, I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up on a throne on a throne so King Uzziah royalty in Israel in Judah is dead but God the king of the universe is on his throne Uzziah is no longer on his throne but God is on his throne brings to mind the scripture in uh, Psalms uh, I believe it's Psalms 11 that uh, the, the, the uh, psalmist asked the question if the foundations be destroyed uh, what can the righteous do and then he goes down and he, he answers his own questions and he talks about that God is on his throne God is on the throne regardless of what happens around us here regardless of what how, how things that we thought were permanent we thought were established regardless of how those things are swept away in a moment of time and yet God is still on his throne you, you might have chaos going all around you it might seem like the rug has been pulled out from under you but understand that God is still on his throne God is still in control of it all and God has been in control of it all and God will always be in control of it all he has already decreed and judged what is going to be allowed and what is not going to be allowed nothing happens without his permission nothing happens without his knowledge and understanding he knows the end from the beginning. He declares the end from the beginning, knowing full well that all of his counsel will be brought to pass. He says, and he describes here, Isaiah is describing what he saw. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain, he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. We kind of have an image here of, of what that might have uh, looked like just from what we read and understand. Uh, you see Isaiah in the lower left-hand corner, and you see the seraphims uh, 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 flying around, uh, uh, being in flight around the throne of God. And when he says his train filled the temple, the skirts of his garments filled the temple, and you can kind of see that. Also, uh, the, the the skirts of his uh, uh, of his garments uh, flowing out from the throne, 
and all uh, to show the 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 uh, uh, the grandeur and and to show the power and to show the majesty of him that sits on the throne. Now Isaiah was uh, we would classify him uh, being from in his time we would classify him as an Oriental or being of the Oriental ex, uh, expression or persuasion uh, meaning uh, Eastern king or uh, Eastern uh, peoples or, or culture in the sense that uh, as opposed to uh, uh, Occidental which is the Western culture uh, we would see uh, that here he is expressing how the Oriental monarchs and uh, Oriental uh, potentates uh, ex uh, showed their importance and their, their rank and their, their majesty by how uh, long the, 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 the length of their robes were when, when they it was in procession, in a uh, uh, royal procession. Uh, the the robe, robes of the, uh, of the emperor, of the king, uh, if, he, if, it was, uh, if he was a, a very high king, uh, he would have very long robes. And, and he would have attendants that would follow behind to lift up that robe and to make sure that it was in order. And so he's saying here that God's uh, robes are uh, fill the temple and, and showing his grandeur that, that he is full of power, full of glory, full of majesty. Uh, and so he says... Um, he saw the seraphims. Now this word, uh, seraphims, the root word there is seraphs. It's a Hebrew word that means burning ones or fiery ones. So he saw the, the, the seraphims, they're on fire. Some have, have ascertained that uh, it also means it could, it could be translated as serpentine ones. Some that was similar to uh, in, in body as a serpent, just as a, like a winged serpent. Just as uh, we see that Moses lifted up the, the serpent in the, in the wilderness. And all that looked upon it would, would be cured of the poisonous bites of the serpents, that uh, the fiery serpents that they had, had uh, suffered from uh and jesus also says that that he has to be lifted up if i the son of man is lifted up from all the earth i will draw all men unto me and so it it was a symbol of of um of, of power, a symbol of, of, of wisdom, a symbol of, of knowledge and all that was that was lifted up. But these these uh, seraphims, uh, a class of angels that if we would go with, as, the, the, as I said, the former uh, translation, the fiery ones, if we would go with that, they were on fire. And I'm going to tell you something. You can't get close to God and get an understanding of God and not be passionate, not be on fire, not be inspired by God to do what you need to do. You can't get close to God and not be quick to be about the, the Father's business. You have to be intense about it. Uh, it stirs you up. Uh, Jeremiah said it this way. He said, I had made up in my mind, so to speak, I'm speaking colloquially, you know, just of the normal language here, but he said in our day and language, he said, uh, I made up my mind. I'm not saying anymore. I'm not going to speak anymore of his name and all. He says, but his word, talking about God's word, was as fire shut up in my bones. I had to preach. I had to speak. I had to share. And that's the way it is when, when God's word is in you you. You have to share it. You have to express it. You have to uh, uh, talk about him because you have to lift him up. See his glory. Look at this. He says in one cried in verse 3 one cried unto another and said holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Just just picture this. Get a, get an uh, uh, a vision of the image of these uh, angelic beings, these spiritual beings, uh, looking across uh, at each other as they are uh, hovering uh, on their wings, two wings to cover their feet, two wings to cover their faces. They couldn't even look upon the glory, the majesty of him who is sitting on the throne. They covered their face out of, of uh, uh, respect and honor. 
uh, of him that is sitting on the throne and all. Servants don't look directly at their master. Servants bow their heads in their master's presence. We see that throughout history. And so here they are, got their faces covered, got their feet covered because they don't just walk in any kind of way. When Moses was at the burning bush, God told him, speaking from the burning bush, told him to take off his shoes because the ground that he was standing on was holy ground. We find that Joshua Joshua experienced the same situation when he was uh, standing before the captain of the Lord's host. Uh, on this, on the other side of the Jordan, before they got ready to cross over into the promised land to uh, 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 capture Jericho, he was told to take off his feet, take off his shoes, his, his uh, uh, sandals, rather, uh, because the, the, uh, the ground that he was standing on was holy. And when you're in the presence of God, understand you're in the presence of holiness. And that is one of the glories of God. That is, that is what glorifies him more than any of the other attributes that we might look for, is his holiness. God is known, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the God of the apostles, the God of the prophets, the God of the, the priests of Israel, that God. That God, that God, the true and the living God, is holy. We look at the at the gods of antiquity. We look at the gods of the Romans, the gods of the Greeks. We look at the gods of the, the Persians. We look at the gods of the Egyptians. Uh, that word is not used when it comes to them. Holiness is not used when it comes to them because those gods had, uh, instead of, Instead of them having the attributes of holy, they had the attributes of holiness. They had the attributes of, of human uh, frailties. Uh, they lusted. They, uh, they were petty gods. They, they got uh, uh, angry and, and, and fought one another and, uh, and, and, and deceived one another. They were open to deception. They could be fooled. But the God of the universe, the, the one and only true God, our God could not be deceived, and he cannot be deceived. Our God transcended all human emotions, all human pettiness. Our God, that's one of the deals that is glorious about him. That's part of his glory, is that he is transcendent. And yet this same God is so intimate with his creation that everywhere we look, the whole earth, as the, as the seraphims are saying, is full of his glory. When I look at the sky in the morning when the sun is rising, I see his glory. When I look at the sky in the evening when the moon is rising and the sun is setting, I see his glory. When I even in the storms, when I see the lightning uh, streaking its fingers across the, 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 uh, the sky, I see his glory. When I hear the wind blowing outside and, and, it's, and it's whipping up a storm, I see his glory. When I hear also in the springtime and the trees are coming out with their blooms and I see the flowers I see his glory but I also see his glory when I hear during that time I hear the birds tweeting I hear them returning from the south coming back north and all because uh, the, the temperature is warming up and all. I see the glory of God I hear the glory of God I experience the glory of God when I feel the freshness of the air I feel the glory of God and also when I see my brothers and my sisters in the Lord I see that smile come across their face I see the, that praise come out of their mouth I see the glory of God he says in one, uh, uh, it says the whole earth is full of his glory. And in verse 4 it says, And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. I see his glory. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now let's understand this. Let's, let's try to uh, wrap our minds around what Isaiah is saying here. When he says that mine eyes have seen the King, I've seen the Lord of hosts. Isaiah saw 
the Lord in a way that God had prepared for him to see as much of him as he could see. In other words, uh, we, we'll see as we go further on in, in the scriptures here that no man, Jesus is talking to us in John the first chapter in the 18th verse, he says, no man has seen God at any time, but the Son of God, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared or he has manifested him or expressed him. He has displayed him. Jesus also told Philip, said, when you see me, you have seen the Father. So here we see another expression of God on human level, on a, on a level where a human could see, where we were able to, to see the glory of God. Not the fullness of his glory. Not, not all, in, 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 not, not, a, not a comprehensive uh, sighting of him, because we're not able to do that. But Isaiah confessed, I want to tell you something. I know that a person has seen some of God's glory. I know that they have come in contact with the presence of God. When I see them confess that they are nothing and that they need God, they need Christ, they need salvation. When they confess their inadequacy, when they confess their need for a Savior, when they confess uh, that they desire for God to save them, then I know that they have come in contact with the presence of God. But as long as I'm hearing somebody talk about how good they are and how much they are, uh, uh, they got things all together with the man upstairs and everything is all good to go and, and they don't need anything else and everything, then I know that they have not met the true and living God. They have not experienced his presence because his holiness causes us to understand that we are clean that we are unclean, that we are undone, that we need a savior. God's holiness always demands that of us because when we see that, it's just like this. You walk into a place and you see there's a, there's a, 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 a celebration going on and you're coming out of the dark and you step into the light of the celebration and it's, it's light all the way around. The room is fully illuminated. And you walk in and everyone is dressed in their finery, their best and all. The first thing that your reaction is when you watch them and you see them dressed in their finery, you see them dressed their best, the first thing you do is you look at yourself. You look back at yourself to see if you can measure up to what you see in them. And that's what happens to us when we come into the contact of the presence of God. We look at ourselves to see if we measure up to what we're seeing, what we're experiencing, the, uh, the, the glory of God. When we see his glory, we look at ourselves. It causes it's an automatic reaction. And then we begin to see our inadequacies. We begin to see our faults and our failures. We begin to see uh, that we have need of a Savior. And out of our mouth comes a confession. Lord, what must I do to be saved? Or Lord, save me. Or Lord, help me. We begin to see we're sinking. And we cry out to the Lord Jesus, who is walking on the water, to lift us up as Peter did. Lord, save me. Let's go. Uh, let me go ahead and finish this in verse 6. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. This reminds me of, of what John the Baptist said. He says, I baptize you with water, but there's one that's coming after me that is mightier than me. He's more worthy than I am. I'm not even worthy to, to take his shoes off, to do what a servant will do. The lowest servant, when the master comes in the house, he looses the shoes of the, of the, of the master and all before he walks into the house. And John is saying, I'm not even worthy to do that. He says, but he's coming after me who will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And so here we have the tongues been taken uh, of, of a coal, live coal, taken off. That means a, a coal that has fire in it. It's taken off the altar. And notice he says he uses tongues. He doesn't, do, he doesn't touch it with his hands, but he uses the tongues to touch it. And yet, those, that live coal touches Isaiah's lips. 
the word of God is so hot it's so hot that not just anybody can handle it you have to handle it specially you have to handle it carefully but when it touches your lips it changes your speech look at this also I heard the voice of the Lord there's something else too when the word of God touches your heart when it touches your lips when you have confessed your sin he forgives you of your sins and he is he is faithful and just to, to uh, uh, cleanse you from all unrighteousness as, as John says in 1st John 1 and 9 if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness well here when we confess our sins and he comes and he saves us uh, with the touch and he fills us with the Holy Ghost when we ask him for it, that that precious gift of the Holy Ghost then our response will be just like Isaiah's I heard the voice of the Lord let me tell you something you really can't hear God until you get saved you really can't hear God what he is saying to you until you have confessed your sins and you open yourself up for his salvation then you're ready to hear him but he heard the Lord saying whom shall I send and who will go for us then said I here am I send me it's not for you to get saved so you can go and sit down in your easy chair and say okay I took care of that I checked that off my bucket list I'm good to go no you become a servant of the Lord, of the Most High God. You become his vessel so that others will be saved. Jesus said it this way, Let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Go with me to uh, Exodus, the 33rd chapter. And... Uh, we're going to start at the 14th verse because I want you to understand something of how God will adjust himself to our level. He adjusts himself. When he reveals himself to us, understand, he's not revealing himself in his natural state, in his full state, but he is revealing himself on the level that we can perceive him, on the level that we can handle him. He is so... Uh, conscious of us he is so uh, loving of us he's so caring for us the psalmist said it this way it says as the father as a father pitied his children so the Lord pitied those that love him for he knoweth our frame that we're but dust also Isaiah the same Isaiah that, that saw the Lord makes the statement about God dealing with us as human beings and he says that God is careful because he says I can't push I can't push too hard I'm, I'm speaking in in, uh, in our language I can't push too hard because this uh, if I do the spirit will burn out in them so God deals with us carefully and in a gingerly manner he deals with us on a level that we're able to receive him isn't that something the great God some of us get a little bit positioned and, and, and we're too, too high, we're too mighty, we're too uh, uh, intelligent to be, inter to be uh, uh, interrupted by anybody or to have interaction with anyone less than our station, station as we see it. But here is the God of the universe from whom all things flow, all things were created, and yet he makes allowance to come down to our level. John put it in such a beautiful way when he said it in, in his uh, gospel in the first chapter. He says, the word was made flesh and dwelt among men. If we translate that literally, it says, the word was made flesh and he pitched his tent with us. He camped out with us. That's our God. Matthew puts it another way. Call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us in Exodus the 33rd chapter in the 14th verse and he said my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest my presence look at that will go with thee and I will give thee rest and he says and 15 says and he said unto him if thy presence go, this is Moses talking to God, if thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. 
For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace? There's that word grace. Uh, and it, this is th this word is translated. That's translated great. Grace is from a Hebrew word that means uh, favor or charm or or uh, 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 delight. Something that's delightful, something that's that's uh, 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 that that has has eloquent e elegance with it, uh, something that is acceptable. So he says, uh, in verse sixteen, that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight. Is it not in that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. In other words, we're going to be a special people. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight. I love it. And I know thee by name. God knows your name. God knows who you really are. He knows really your character. You're not looking at the outward. He told Samuel that. And Samuel spoke to the children of Israel that same way. He says, he says, man looks on the outward countenance, but I look at the heart. I see the content of your character. And all these folks that's running around, I know I'm going to upset some folks now, but all you that's running around looking at <coughs> color and looking at the outside of folks, and all in judging them by that, you're not operating under the Spirit of God. I don't care what your title is. I don't care what your position in the church is. If you are looking, you can call yourself Christian all day long, but if you are not looking at the heart, the character of a person, but you're looking at the outside of a person, you're black and you don't want to deal with white folk, you're white and you don't want to deal with black folks, you're uh, 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 white or black, you don't want to deal with folks of Asian or Hispanic origin or whatever, you're looking at the outside, the outward appearance of a, of a person and all and you judging them by that and all you're not operating under the spirit of God because when you start judging folks by that you're trying to judge God's work God's handiwork God is the one that made the choice of, of what color you was going to be God is the one that made the choice of what culture you grow up in God is the one that made the choice of where you what country what nation you would be born into so when you start judging things like that you're judging God's action and let me tell you something. God's going to get you. Verse 18. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. See his glory. Show me your glory. Let me see your glory. This word here, uh, glory, means honor. Show me your honor. Show me, let me put it, show me your character. I want to know who you really are, God. Show me the fullness of who you are. Let me put it another way. Don't hide anything from me. I want to see you as you are without any filters, without any kind of veil, without any kind of, um, of protection. Let me see you as you really are. Your honor, your splendor, your dignity. And he said, I will make all my goodness. <laughs> I'm going to make all my goodness. This is God talking. Pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And this, this word, the name of the Lord, this word Lord is in the King James Version, a capital L-O-R-D, meaning I will proclaim the name of the I am that I am. I'm going to proclaim who I be before thee and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, thou canst not see my face. Now, look at this. Let's go back up here. To the 14th verse, uh, 15th verse, well, 14th verses, uh, my presence shall go with thee. And this same word for presence is the same word here for faith. 
face. Say, so thou canst not see my face. Paunim. That's the Hebrew word for face and for presence. So what he's saying here, you can't see my presence. You can't see my, the full of my presence. Okay, what does that mean? Jesus said to Nicodemus in the third chapter of John, the Gospel of John, he says to him, he says, uh, he said, the wind blows and it lists and you don't know where it's going to list. You, you really don't know when it's going to start up and when it's going to die down. You, you don't really know the moment that it's going to do it until it happens. It shows up and then it's and it, then it's it's gone even though the wind is still there there's still air there there's still oxygen there's still air currents moving but it's not moving at the intensity where you can detect it he says so are they that are born of the spirit so god's presence is with us even when we are not aware of it god's presence is with us even when we don't feel it jesus promised us this he says i'm with you always even to the end of the world so here, God's presence is there, but the fullness of his glory, the fullness of his presence, the fullness of his face is not seen, is not experienced by Moses, and cannot be experienced by any man. Notice what he says, for there shall no man see me and live. The word here that's used for for this, this translated to see me means to inspect, to look upon in detail. Notice this when Isaiah says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. I saw him on the throne high and lifted up. But if you notice, he describes the seraphims with their wings, but he doesn't describe him that sits on the throne. We'll deal with that. Verse 22, verse 21, he says, And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passes by, that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand, while I pass by. And I will take away my hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Another way of putting this is, You will see my receding glory. You will see the afterglow of my presence but you won't see the fullness of my presence let's go to first timothy the sixth chapter in the sixteenth verse it's talking about let's 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 start uh... I'm going to start at the 13th verse. Paul is talking to Timothy. He says, I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth or makes alive all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. See his glory. Paul says also in Colossians 1 and 27. So since so how how do we how do we equate how do we 
uh, take these two and put them together. What Paul is saying is the same thing that is said in, in the 33rd chapter of Exodus. No man can see God's glory. Now, no man can see, which is also the same thing that is said in John the first chapter and the 18th verse. Uh, no man has seen God at any time, meaning that no man has seen the fullness of God as he is in his natural state. We've seen uh, similitudes. We've seen images of God that God has provided in a way that we can stand it, in a way that we can, we can handle it. But we have not seen him in his fullness. But look at this. In uh, Colossians 1 and 27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Which is Christ in you the hope of glory. 1 Peter 5. And we're going to start at... Uh, We'll just do five and one. The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. What are you talking about, preacher? What does that got to do with anything? It has to do with this: that when we deal with God's glory, if you want to see the fullness of God glory, God's glory. Look at Christ. In Christ you are able to see the fullness of God's glory. That's why Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This is why Jesus Christ is in a class all to himself. This is why Jesus Christ has the preeminence above everyone else. Above Buddha. Above Muhammad. Above anyone, you, me, any of us, Jesus Christ is the fullness of God's glory. In the same Colossians, it says the fullness of the Godhead or the fullness of divinity dwelt in him bodily. But look at this. As Peter was saying that we're partakers of his glory. And as Paul also says that in us, Christ, the hope of glory. So when we look at each other, understand something. That's why we got to be careful how we treat one another. We have to be careful how we interact with each other. We have to be careful about what we put our mouth on each other because of the fact that when you're talking about someone who has been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, in that person dwells the glory of God. Paul tells us it when he writes to the church of Corinth, and he says this, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. God dwells in you. He also tells us in his letter to the church at Rome, when he talks in the 10th chapter of Romans, and he says this, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, meaning the word is near thee. It is even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is faith. The word of faith which we preach. That's what he's talking about. In you, the hope of glory. You want to see his glory? Look at your brother and sister and see his glory. Look in the mirror if you're saved and see his glory. And if you're not saved, you won't see his glory in his fullness because you're undone. Ask Isaiah in the sixth chapter of Isaiah. You're unclean and you dwell among a people that are unclean with unclean lips. You don't even have clean words to say. You're not saying the right words. You don't speak right. You don't have the right language. But when you accept Christ, when you allow him to touch your lips, when you allow him to touch your tongue and purge your sin, when you allow him to change you from the inside out, for Paul says this, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. All things become new. Another way of putting it is, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Ephesians, the second chapter, says the Holy Spirit is in us, fashioning us, 
craft, we are his craftsmanship, his masterpiece. He's working on us as a sculpture works on a piece of marble to, to, to release the image that's in that marble that that sculpture has in his mind. To release it by chipping away all the outward parts that are not part of that image. A painter. That stirs up his 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 colors, his his uh, uh paints, and he stirs them up to get that right uh light, that right mixture, where he can express what is in his mind. The architect that has the blueprints in his mind before he puts them on paper, so that others can follow along and build the building. That's what God is doing in us. In his mind, in the, you are in the mind of God, in the mind of Christ, and you are his glory because you are the expression of God's glory through salvation. That's why don't walk around with your head down. Don't walk around in sorrow. Paul says we're not like others that have, have lost their loved ones, have lost their friends, have lost uh, 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 those that uh, the, their leaders and all they have lost great folks that was in their life that mentors that that had an, a great effect in their life he said we're not like other folks that have lost them who have no hope but if your mother knew Christ if your father knew Christ if your spouse knew Christ if your children knew Christ if your brothers and sisters, your siblings knew Christ, if your friends, if your neighbors knew Christ, knew Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, you will see him again. Give God glory. Give God praise. Because they are alive more now than they ever were when you were interacting with them. And you will be alive more when you stand in the presence of God than you have ever been in your existence. David tells us as we close, David tells us in Psalm 16, In thy presence is fullness of joy, at thy right hand are, ple ple are pleasures forevermore. In thy presence, in your painting, in your face, Lord, behold in your face, I see fullness of joy. I see pleasures at your right hand forevermore. In your presence, before your face, there is no sickness, there is no death, there is no disease, there is no sufferings, there is no tribulation. And there are no enemies able to touch me if I'm in your presence. David said it this way in Psalm 20, 23. Thou prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Why? Because I'm in your presence, Lord. And they can't touch me. You're not my head with all. My cup runs over. I can stay here as long as I want. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. See his glory, saints. See his glory. Seek him. And seek him first. And his righteousness. And everything you need will be added. Father, thank you for the glory that has been revealed to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, your dear Son. Thank you for the power and the authority that you have granted to us in his name. That we have been made more than conquerors over all the works of the enemy. And we don't, we don't hold back anymore. We don't step back anymore from <coughs> the challenge that you have called us to. Because you have called us into a worthy vocation to walk upright before you. And having all these promises, we cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. So that your holiness, your glory will be perfected in us. And that the light that you have placed in us will shine before men and women everywhere. That they will see your good works and glorify you who are in heaven. We bless you. We praise you. We thank you and we honor you, Lord. We love you, Father, and we give you all the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you, saints. Again, see his glory.